Hello, I'm uh, delighted to say that I'm speaking to someone today that I've admired for many years. Uh, he's a very experienced Alexander teacher, um, an accomplished musician, and a very nice guy, uh, Ron Collier. Hello, Ron. Hello, hi. <laughs> Welcome to the Developing Self uh, Alexandrian Education Conference. That's my pleasure. Uh, I wondered, Ron, if we could start off with you perhaps just telling us a little bit about yourself. Yes, well, I mean, you've just put it in a nutshell, really. So um, I grew up as a, you know, uh, as a musician and uh, uh, I ended up playing in, uh, first of all, the Philharmonia Orchestra and the BBC Symphony Orchestra. And um, I really uh, think now that uh, I probably wouldn't have got that far without the help of my uh, first Alexander teachers, Dick and Elizabeth Walker, who of course trained with Alexander himself. And um, they kind of rescued me from uh, the, some of the ill effects of my music college training. Um, you know, I'd come out with a, a lot of tension and a block, blocks about improving my sort of technical performance and all of that. And the Alexander work cleared that and opened the way really to go on into professional playing. Um, uh, but a little further down the line, I began to think, well, I really want to share this Alexander stuff with other people. And so I, um, I sort of went freelance and uh, then I uh, trained with Walter Carrington uh, and um, subsequently went teaching and uh, then um, sometime later I joined uh, uh, Ray Evans who'd started a training course uh, in, in Buckinghamshire uh, as his assistant and uh, I, I now run that course uh, myself, Ray Dive, uh, and I took over and uh, so I combined training students with Alexander teaching in the usual sense and uh, I still teach and play um, the violin, which I love doing. <clears throat> so um, I have a lot of therefore contact with uh, children and uh, that's the connection with uh, what we're going to talk about. Thank you, Ron. Uh, that kind of really naturally brings us on to the, uh, the question. Um, you're going to talk about primitive reflexes. So, uh, well, what, what are primitive reflexes? Well, um, of course, what we're going to say uh, in the time we have is only going to scratch the surface and um, I, I, I'm going to try to give an impression of some of the reflexes that um, I'm going to talk about but I would really encourage people to go onto YouTube where you can easily find uh, videos of babies responding in these reflex ways and on the whole they do it better than I can so um, do, do have a look. So what are primitive reflexes? Well, first of all, we ought to um, just think about the meaning of the word reflex here. So we're using it specifically to refer to patterns of movement and response, which are hardwired into the neuromuscular system in utero and in the first couple of years of life and they're mediated in the brain stem and midbrain. So their function is um, adaptogenic. They're often called survival reflexes, which really explains their purpose perfectly. 
they emerge at various stages, pre and postpartum, but later they're either integrated into the nervous system so that they're not stimulated unless absolutely necessary, or they transform into a mature or adult response. But for various reasons, all this may not happen quite satisfactorily. And the reflexes remain to some extent active and too easily stimulated. There might be genetic causes for that, stresses during pregnancy, perinatal accident, the emotional stability in life of the mother, her diet, prolonged exposure to pollution, toxic chemicals, and to wireless electromagnetic radiation are thought to be hazards. So a really simple example of this process of flowering of a reflex and its subsequent integration is the sucking and rooting reflex in which a tactile stimulus to the side of the baby's cheek head causes her head to turn to that side so increasing the chances of finding the mother's breast now obviously the survival function here will not be needed after some time and so the reflex is absorbed or inhibited into the nervous in the nervous system fairly unusually for this particular reflex the inhibition is not completed and the tactile stimulus may continue to cause flickers of the old response which can be very easy for the person concerned they're very irritating for the purpose person concerned so there are rather a lot of these reflexes <clears throat> and it's fairly easy easy to sort of get lost and confused in a whole long list but and here i have to pay tribute to my friend and colleague mike cross for this insight it's instructive for our work to think about just four of these reflexes they throw light particularly on the development of balance posture and movement and in the case of retained reflexes they're not integrated or inhibited or transformed they and many other reflexes will interfere with coordination uh, handwriting is a good example of what might be affected um, emotional states and the ability to think clearly so the first of these four is the moro reflex this is basically a fear response now most of us will be familiar with the startle pattern also known as the strauss reflex which frank pierce jones talked about but when I first started to learn and think about all this, I began to notice that some people do not react to fearful situations in the way that Frank Pierce Jones described. And I also noticed that FM talks about fear reflexes in the plural. And I wonder whether, with his tremendous powers of observation, he recognised a variety of individual responses, although the uh, knowledge and terminology about reflexes we have now would not have been around at his time. So this startle reflex is a mature adult response in which the head is retracted, the shoulders go up, the arms and legs uh, draw in, the eyes blink, and the breath is held. When the person is able to conclude by observation and consideration that the danger is past, the reflex response dwindles 
and disappears. Although, as Pierce Jones remarked, continued uh, stimulation of this response in the individual's personal life will impact habitual use in the Alexander sense. So notice here the words observation and consideration because they point to a conscious cortical element in the process. Um, by the way, if you start to investigate any of this, you will find that the word startle is sometimes used when talking about the moral reflex, which is a very unhelpful confusion. So um, I'm going to stick to calling it the Strauss pattern. That's the one Pierce Jones talked about. So notice that the overall result of the Strauss reaction is a kind of physical shrinking, which winds the system up so that it's ready to get the hell out if necessary when the immediate danger has passed. But the Moro reflex is totally different. It has two opposing phases. We shall see that pattern in the other reflexes we're going to talk about as well. Newborn babies are tested for the Moro reflex routinely because at that stage it should be there. It develops in utero and it won't be integrated and transformed into the adult Strauss reflex for another two to three months after birth. So its absence immediately after birth would indicate a neurological deficit. So in the test, the infant is held supine and her head is lowered a little bit below the level um, of the spine. And this triggers the reflex, which is a hyperextension through the body. The arms and legs are thrown out, the eyes open wide, the breath is drawn sharply in, and the skin color reddens. So basically, <laughs> like this. So unlike the Strauss pattern, there's a throwing out an occupying of more physical and auditory space, signaling basically, mummy, mummy, mummy. So this is followed by a second phase when the head flexes, the arms and legs flex, the eyes close, the breath goes out, perhaps accompanied by crying. So from here, And that signals, hold me, hold me, hold me. So as I thought about all of this, I began to observe that some people and students, pupils and students, exhibit subtle forms of this moral response, especially the first extension phase, rather than the adult Strauss version. So now the impulse might be to suppose that my job as an Alexander teacher is to in teach the pupil to inhibit this response. Now, just a minute. Alexander's inhibition is a conscious decision-making process, is it not? But the moral reflex is mediated in the brainstem and basal ganglia. And so, unlike the Strauss response, it's not available to conscious reasoning processes. And if I don't understand that, I'm likely to get very frustrated with both my pupil and myself. The pupil will get more anxious in consequence, and that will stimulate his or her moral reflex still more. Now, You'll remember that Margaret Goldie and others described how Alexander would sometimes get you to come right forward in the chair so that your elbows rested just behind your 
knees with your head anti-flexed. Now, that's remarkably like a, an acting out of the second stage of Moro. Moro too is what diffuses the fear and distress of the first stage. And really, it's the only antidote. FM's way of doing it was rather formal. Perhaps that was as far as one could go in those days. You know, people didn't uh, get on the floor and so on and crawl around and all of that. But students used to say the, the little monster, referring to the Moro, is out of the cage. Perhaps because of some emotional situation, past or present. I might either do Alexander's thing or I might suggest the yoga pose of a child, or darts fetal crouch, or simply curling up on one side on the table with a cushion for the head and a blanket tucked around for a bit of comforting swaddling. And plenty of reassurance that the person doesn't feel that they have failed to inhibit and direct. So rather than trying to stop or, worst of all, fight the reflex, you go with it. You let the natural process complete itself. The other three reflexes that we're talking about all have the word tonic in their names. They're to do with the changes in muscle tone in the relationship of the head, neck, with the torso. The tonic labyrinthine reflex, or TLR, has to do, as its name suggests, with the stimulation and development of the inner ear balancing systems. And in the infant, it's a beautiful and graceful extension of the torso and the limbs in quite a different way from Moro. And as well as helping balance, it facilitates the strengthening of the extensors of the back. Now the asymmetric tonic neck reflex, ATNR which is fascinating from our point of view as Alexander teachers, I think. It's stimulated in this sort of way. So the baby's on the floor, maybe supine, and exploring what, can, what she can see. Turning the head, perhaps, towards a nice colourful object over there. When she turns the head, the reflex determines that the arm and leg on that side extend. And meanwhile, the limbs on the other side will flex. So it's that kind of thing. So that increases the chances of meeting the toy with her hand and then perhaps the grasping reflexes come into play. So it expresses really, I want that. And it has a lot to do, I think, with um, widening in the Alexander sense. There are colloquial names for some of these reflexes, and this one is sometimes called the goalkeeper reflex. <laughs> or another name is the archer reflex. And that reminds us that these patterns do remain there and can be called on in adult life to give rapid pre-conscious resources when needed. So the fourth of the reflexes is 
the symmetrical tonic neck reflex, STNR. Whereas the ATNR we just talked about has the function of distinguishing the left and right halves of the body and if it's retained may cause confusion with sidedness you know your dominant hand dominant leg and so on and hence coordination problems but the STNR symmetrical tonic neck reflex helps to distinguish the top from the bottom it's lovely to watch in a little one so here she is, she's lying on her front and mummy comes in. The baby hears mummy's voice and her movement and wants to see her. So she lifts her head and that increase in neck tone causes the arms to extend and the legs to flex. So she sits back. Uh, it's sometimes called the cat sit reflex. Now, just like the Moro and the ATNR, this one has two phases. So there's, you know, suggestions of antagonistic action in this whole process, these opposing uh, double phases of, of the reflexes. Yeah. In phase two of STNR, if the neck flexes, perhaps because the baby looks down, then the arms will flex and the legs extend, try to straighten. And so she promptly sticks her bottom in the air, much to the delight of the fond spectators. <laughs> then in the initial stages of crawling, before the STNR is quite integrated, the baby on hands and knees might get interested in something ahead and want to move towards it. But the act of looking forward to see causes the neck to extend and therefore the arms to extend and the legs to try to flex. And so she ends up actually crawling backwards. Again, highly entertaining for the adults who adoringly remark that she hasn't quite worked it out yet, <laughs> which of course implies that there's some sort of conscious puzzle solving involved. But as we've seen, it's got nothing to do with the frontal cortex. It's very much an embodied sensory process. So this brings us to the vital importance of crawling. And prior to that, of the baby being allowed to be on the floor to discover through the help of gravity and her innate curiosity how to roll over. There are rolling and head writing reflexes to help that so that she can be prone and get the stimulation of the floor to the ventral surfaces of the body, the trigeminal nerves in the face, all of which Raymond Dart described so beautifully. Hopefully she is not parked in some wretched device that aims to prop her up in a way that she's not ready for. Then with the help of STNR, she comes onto her hands and knees and will spend some time rocking backwards and forwards. And that has the function of gradually, with a lot of repetition, inhibiting Moro, TLR and STNR. And as she takes her first steps, first with homolateral crawling, so left leg, left hand, 
right leg, right hand. And then as the ATNR, which is asymmetrical, divides the body left and right, becomes inhibited or integrated, she then discovers lateral movement, cross lateral movement. So left leg, right hand, left hand, right leg which is the foundation of so much of our mature movement coordination. Now, some people don't crawl as a baby. Me, for instance. So I was A, forceps delivered, and B, I was a bottom shuffler. So with the forceps delivery, perhaps, I didn't get the natural passage of the neonate rotating through the birth canal and that if you don't have that that will contribute to a retained ATNR and STNR and that then interferes with the development of crawling. So I've observed and gradually made sense of over the years the decided reluctance of my legs to do their supporting work very efficiently. Now, nature moves on. I still got to walk, but probably this retention of STNR and also ATNR for me was part of the reason I didn't do and very much disliked sport. I did, however, enjoy playing the violin because the legs aren't quite so important for that. And eventually I got paid for doing it. Now, when I trained as an Alexander teacher, Walter Carrington, who clearly got me pretty well sussed, <laughs> suggested very strongly, which was uncharacteristic for him, <laughs> that, I, that I'd better do a lot of crawling. First, using homolateral movement very slowly and consciously, and then progressing to cross lateral, which took a hell of a lot of working out for me. Then he suggested even that I did it to the beat of a metronome. It made a huge difference in all sorts of ways and I continue to enjoy and benefit from crawling activities. So this now brings us close to home and the practice of what we call monkey. Patrick MacDonald said that it's vital to the development of a good back and that he couldn't understand why some people were not doing enough of it. Now you'll often see that a baby who spent time crawling will tend then to start to pull herself up onto the furniture into a lovely natural monkey where she'll do the same sort of rocking movements that she did on hands and knees. So she's preparing and exercising her vestibular system as well as strengthening and coordinating her back extensors. We need to keep doing this in monkey with our hands on back of a chair or on a horizontal surface or on a pupil. As babies we each did whatever development we could. But with Alexander's work, we are engaged in the continuing development of the self. And I think there are ways, some of which we've hinted at, in which we can call on this knowledge of infant development to nourish and inspire our individual journeys and help others to do the same. You think, Sue, that we've finally arrived uh, in, in just relatively recently at a stage where in, a, in our work we, we, we can stop saying the Alexander technique is very special <laughs> and it's got nothing to do with this. It isn't yoga and it isn't uh, this and it isn't that <laughs> and start to say, well, hello. <laughs> um, 
all you other people we've got stuff to share here oh god yeah i couldn't agree more i mean this is what we're actually trying to get going by doing this conference you know, I mean, obviously we, we were originally going to be all together in the same place, which would have been much better because there's so many questions I could ask you. There are so many questions people watching this will want to ask you. What we'd hoped was to draw in more people from outside the Alexander world. Uh, and that's really what our aim is, is to find yeah. people with expertise and where we, where we complement each other. I imagine that if we, you and I were now having a cup of coffee after our chat, <laughs> um, we'd end up talking about things like the work that you've done with things like Brain Gym and Pace and the links there with, uh, the, you know, um, the development of mature movement and coordination, because are they not sort of antidotes or <laughs> whatever to to these retained reflexes yeah i mean i would think so and i think you know what, what's uh, for me the work that i mean i can see with you it's the same you you identify that there is sort of a problem that you can't quite figure yeah. something is going on with this person and i just do not know what it is and all my alexander skills are don't seem to be making any difference in fact perhaps they're even making things worse um and i've noticed with you know with children you know particularly the what is it the asymmetrical tonic reflex where the head goes you know the arm goes out of the head when it comes to writing when you've got yeah. a child where that reflex is uh it has not moved on you know neurodevelopmental delay or whatever they call it the, the, the writing you know there's this is going on and i i distinctly remember seeing that in a child and so obviously you know you put your hands on and you kind of go oh i try it like this they really can't do it no <laughs> exactly yeah um and um, you there are if you if you go on to youtube you'll soon come across there are um uh, protocols or procedures for helping uh, retain reflexes to integrate or to be inhibited and so on. They, there's a place particularly in Chester um, oh, yeah. where Peter Blythe and Sally Goddard Blythe who uh, wrote two wonderful books about all of this which are listed in the uh, references list uh, that people can access um, th and they are involved in you know remedial programs and so on they go into schools they work with individuals and so on there's a lovely little sort of scenario that I always uh, enjoy um, and you gave the one about of course the the ATNR which you know so the baby's head turned and it, it completely disables the writing hand perhaps or whatever but there's one for the STNR so you have to imagine here's little Tommy in class and uh, he's quite happy because uh, the teacher's writing on the board and he's he's looking um, at, the, at the board or the screen or whatever it is yeah and then the teacher says now open your books and write your name and the date at the top of the page. Yeah. Now Tommy has a retained STNR. So when he looks down at his book, he somehow finds that because flexion of the neck causes extension of the legs, that he's standing up. So he has to think quickly, Miss, can I be excused? <laughs> He goes to the toilet and he comes back and he sits down and he gets his book and he goes to write his name and his neck flexes and his legs extend and he stands up. So, uh, Miss, my pencil needs sharpening. But sooner or later he's going to run out of excuses. <laughs> will have marked him down as a troublemaker. So what he has to do is to learn compensations yeah so 
wrapping the legs around the chair leg is a good one or sitting on one or both legs stops the reflex from happening and of course it's pasting over the cracks god um, that's so true that and, and he's probably going to get labeled as adhd precisely um there's yeah and um in fact uh, ray evans who was my mentor in this and lots of other things um he used to say that the and you sort of referred to it when you said somehow you know trying to take someone's head or, or something um somehow makes it worse um and he said that the difficulty is that sometimes our work um sort of rather shoves sweeps things under the carpet uh you know and there's something in there like as you said that we can't put our fingers on um yeah which we have to find other ways to um, address. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think also, Ron, isn't it? You, you said something in your talk, you know, which was so resonated with me, that as Alexander teachers, we expect people to be able to have the potential for conscious control. So, you know, that you can actually use the neocortex to work this out and you can interfere with this process that's happening and you can make a change, but it's not necessarily true. There are certain things that you cannot just <laughs> inhibit and direct and it's going to be fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll give you another little example. Oh, yes, please. And it's from quite a long time ago, I think. Um, I was um, in a workshop and there was a very experienced uh, Alexander teacher uh, taking the workshop. So one of the people I knew um, in the workshop was someone I was pretty sure who had, like me, a retained STNR, the one that Tommy had in the classroom. Um, now, um, if you want the legs to work in such a case, you'd really better not try to take someone straight up out of the chair because it won't work and it didn't work and she and the teacher wasn't prepared to change their approach and um you know the the person was just left you know rather agitated and feeling a failure, I guess, or, or something like this. So if only the teacher could have taken her a fraction further forward, the reflex would have engaged and her legs would have cooperated and extended, yeah? Um, so there's an example of, a very simple example of the need to adapt, really. You know, the, the joke, how many Alexander teachers does it take to change a light bulb? Uh, well, one changes the light bulb and then a room full of them sit around saying, well, we didn't do it like that on my training course. <laughs> so, Ron, I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, that's such an interesting uh, talk. And the, the information in it, I think, is val invaluable to us as, as Alexander teachers. Um, so... Thank you very much, um, and uh, and goodbye. It's been my pleasure, Sue. Thank you. Yeah.